Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome again to Syrian Analysis. I'm your host, Kirk Kalmasian. Thank you very much for tuning in to today's live streaming. I appreciate you all, whether you're watching us on YouTube, on Rumble, and on X. So has the war in Lebanon started? There are conflicting reports. Israel says that they are trying to wage a war, a ground invasion of Lebanon. On the other side, Hezbollah says that they have repelled. Some of the troops were trying to penetrate the Lebanese borders and they have uh, hit them directly. Today, I'm going to discuss this developing issue and also the criticism directed against Iran with Sayyid Mohammed Marandi and Vanessa Billy. Thank you so much for joining me today in this live streaming. It's a really pleasure to have you both and discuss this developing issue. I think we could start this conversation with the military objectives of um, uh, Iran, uh, sorry, uh, Israel, from this <laughs> attempted ground invasion of uh, Lebanon. There are three scenarios and three theories that people are raising in the press and in, on social media platforms. Uh, Dr. Mavandi, if I want to start this with you. So the first scenario, they say that the, the, the aim, the goal is to occupy southern Lebanon till the uh, line of uh, River Litani. Uh, the second is only to disarm uh, Hezbollah, and the third is to destroy the infrastructure of Lebanon and eventually encourage the Lebanese people to turn against Hezbollah and do a regime change in Beirut and install a completely, let's say, US-friendly, Israel-friendly government there. So on which, whose side uh, do you think, or which side is more accurate in your opinion? I think all of them are accurate. And I would also add that uh, Israel, the Israeli regime is a colony and it's expansionist and it's supremacist uh, and it's eth ethno-supremacist. Even though it's not an ethnicity, the Zionists have come from Europe and other parts of the region where they're not Semites uh, as much as the Palestinians themselves are. But in any case, it's an expansionist regime. So. Uh, I think that uh, this was, if they were allowed to continue, this would be just a part of a process that has been going on for 76 years. Their intention is to take the whole of the West Bank. That has always been the intention. The two-state solution was always fake. Uh, the West always knew it was not going to happen. They just wanted to buy time for the Israeli regime. They wanted to keep things quiet. And we were saying that all along. Uh, but, and as... We saw over the years, they colonized uh, the West Bank increasingly. Now, I think 800,000 of the most rabid Zionists are in the West Bank. The worst of the worst of the Zionists are actually in the West Bank. So Lebanon is no different. They're, Israel doesn't recognize borders. When you are, when everyone is Amalek, and I got into trouble apparently with the BBC today because of <laughs> some of the things I said. If you <laughs> check my tweet, but or my two tweets, but uh, we are all Amalek, so we are all inferior. When you and this is how imperialism, this is how colonialism justified itself from hundreds of years ago. The civilizing mission, the civilized um, people, the civilized Europeans. They would have special privileges. They were the adults. The natives were backward. The natives were childlike. They didn't know how to self-govern. They didn't understand the concept of ownership. So they were less. They were less human. And in many cases, they were not human, as we saw with slaves and, and so on. So um, this is the same concept. When, when one person is superior to another, one is more human than others, this is going to be the, um, the, the natural outcome. So I think that all three are correct in addition to what I said, but I do think that we have reached a turning point. I think the axis of resistance has not only succeeded in uh, uh, hurting the Israeli regime despite uh, all the Western support that it received. And this I think is an important point that we should remember. The Israeli regime is a puny and weak regime without Western support. It is nothing. Remember how, I mean, in Iran, they were just, someone just a couple of days ago, uh, some previous politician and a fool said that the Israeli was saying basically that the Israelis know everything. 
But just today we heard that the Israeli regime heard from the Americans that Iran is going to fight. Well, I thought they knew everything. I thought they had infiltrated everywhere. If Iran is going to strike, they're going to be striking with a large number of missiles from all over the place. How would they not know? It's not really all. So obviously their intelligence, their capabilities are very limited. And what they have is because of the collective West being behind them. And, and let me also say that Israel has not achieved anything against Hezbollah outside of Beirut. None of Hezbollah's tunnels and assets, which are thousands of kilometers long, and they, they go across southern Lebanon and central Lebanon and parts of northern Lebanon, from what I hear, none of these have been destroyed or found out by the Israelis. All these missile centers and bases, hospitals and command and control centers underground, the only place where they had success was in, De in Beirut. And why is that the case? Because Beirut has always been a center for Western espionage before I ever said, before I was born. So when you have all these Western embassies and you have all these Western NGOs and all these Western journalists coming and going, I don't mean all journalists are, are like that, but they have many spies among these corporate media journalists and they have spies everywhere. And then you have people like Samir Jaaja and these uh, fanatics uh, that uh, have been allies of Israel and they carried out a genocide in Sabra and Shatila the last time they occupied uh, Beirut. So they, I, I'm not entirely surprised that, were, that they were able to discover uh, the whereabouts of Sayyid Hassan Nasrullah. Uh, but this was strange, uh, Sayyid Muhammad Marandi. I mean, a meeting in the middle of a Dahiye, which is exposed and remember, even before the assassination, when uh, several bombings happened of Adahiye, there were cameras sitting on the ground uh, documenting the bombing before it happened. So it was quite clear that there was a big infiltration, let's say intelligence infiltration of al -Dahiyye. And despite that, I was I was not shocked that uh, Sayyid Nasrallah was assassinated because they were after him for 30 years. I was shocked that he was assassinated in Dahiyye itself, where I was there multiple times and we know all types of <coughs> motorcycles can get in and the security is not really tight there. But we are speaking of now an yeah, expanding really, world. No open security. Let me just point out because our viewers have never been there. I lived uh, in in that area for a year because, uh, and I, I think I, we met there actually uh, many years ago. I, I was on sabbatical in, uh, in at AUB and with Conflicts Forum during 2011 and 12, and so I lived in and I know the neighborhood that was bombed. And I've walked by those six buildings that, that were flattened, those apartment towers with hundreds of people inside. Many times I drove by them. Um, Dahi is, is not separate from the rest of Beirut. You just drive in. You don't, if you don't know the city, you don't know where Dahi uh, begins and Beirut ends. And so it is very easy for anyone. And you have so many refugees, Palestinians, Syrians, and people coming and going. And just if you recall, just a, a couple of months ago, I think it, those, what was it, those Norwegian uh, soldiers that were captured yes. in Dahiyeh, uh, who were carrying it. So the West has been working hard. I don't know why Sayyid Hassan is there, and I can't speculate, but Sayyid Hassan is not just a military commander. He is the overall commander of Hezbollah, the leader of Hezbollah. So he has political duties, and he had his political duties and responsibilities. I'm sure he had to be involved in Beirut. But the point I'm making, I'm not saying, uh, you know, this was, we were hit and this was, uh, you know, people were crying on the streets and refugees who had no place to go. They just lost their houses. They were just crying because of him. They weren't crying for their loss. But uh, what I'm trying to say is that Israel is not, uh, has nothing, is nothing on its own. It is nothing on its own. It is the collective West the five eyes, the American AWACS that are flying off of the coast of Beirut right now. It is the drones. It is, you know, it is all of them together that are working together with the Israelis and providing them with weapons and uh, ammunition and bunker busters to slaughter families. A, a, a young husband and wife uh, and their, and their uh, young child, maybe more than one yes. child now, uh, 
who was at my son's wedding because they were classmates during the year we were living here, he came to Iran and uh, he happened to be in Iran during my son's wedding and they, and they came over and uh, they, they've, been, they've been killed. They were martyred. Uh, Unfortunately, there's so many families have been yes, wiped out. Okay. And we can see we can see that this war is expanding, and also Vanessa knows that uh, Israeli strikes escalated uh, on Syria, for example, on the border crossings where mm -hmm. the refugees and the displaced people are moving nowadays. Uh, it escalated in Damascus, inside the city, yesterday in Mazze, for example. It killed one Syrian journalist, and they're also what I call Israelis distributing carrots in the press for the fake newsers to uh, grab. The this news, for example, they say uh, Syria is now developing nuclear weapons again. 40,000 40, 40, Yemenis arrived to the Golan Heights and also they say that there was an attempted assassination against the brother of the Syrian president uh, Maher al-Assad. All are fake news, the three of them. But uh, Vanessa, from your position in Damascus, uh, don't you think that... Um, I'm not saying it will happen, but hypothetically speaking, if Lebanon falls, Syria is next, right? They tried regime change in Syria for the sake of encircling and besieging Hezbollah. And now they are coming after Hezbollah in order to cut one of the elements of strength of Syria in this case, which is also leverage in the region. So don't you see that the Lebanon's war is also Syria's war? How is the perception there in Damascus? Oh, absolutely. You know, I don't think this, this war is disconnected in any way, because if it's Lebanon's war and if it's lost in Lebanon, it comes to Syria. If it's lost in Syria, it comes to Iraq. And if it's lost in Iraq, it comes to Yemen and then to Iran. So it's like a, a domino effect across the resistance axis. And of course, what we're seeing now is uh, Hezbollah containing that expansionist conflict, as uh, Sayyid Mohammed mentioned. And, and I, I just want to mention the article in Jerusalem Post that was published and then immediately taken down, where they actually yes. talk about the religious uh, rationale for taking control effectively of uh, Lebanon. And I yes. think within one hour of it being published, it was taken down because obviously they perceived that it was a little bit in advance of their strategy. And uh, yes, in the last few days, we've seen an escalation. I mean, the Maha story actually came from drones that were shot down overhead where I am uh, hmm. because Yafor is, is not far up the road from me. Uh, but the drones were shot down. And then suddenly someone sent me this story about Maher and I was like, oh, come on. I mean, this is like the story in Masyaf when Israel attacked uh, the scientific research center in Masyaf close to Homs with drones and with missiles. And then suddenly they put out this James Bond story that in the middle of all of this, with the air defense uh, going off uh, in Syria and so on, they managed to somehow get a helicopter in, land the, the kind of dairy milk tray guys to blow up the, the scientific and research center. And these centers are also built underground, very similar to, I think, to the bunkers that are used by Hezbollah uh, in, in southern Lebanon and in Dakhye. So they're virtually impossible to destroy. They needed. 85 2000 pound bombs to actually assassinate Nasrallah. I mean, this is I was, by the way, I was, I was, uh, I, I was a thousand meters from the that attack, and uh, I was sitting with a friend in the uh restaurant cafe of Asahe Hotel, and uh, then suddenly it just came, and they were like right one right after the uh, mm -hmm. other. Not like not a second apart, a fraction of a second apart, and people, girls were screaming and women were screaming. We went out and you saw that they had slaughtered hundreds of people. Yes. And and the in the Western media, they've been you know all this time they're talking about Hezbollah strongholds. They want to uh, downplay the fact that these that these yeah. uh, you know that the Israeli regime is carrying out genocide, that they're slaughtering women and children. And then after murdering Sayyid Hassan and his, and his martyrdom, they, they, they told people in Dahia that we're going to strike these three buildings. And they gave very short notice. Many people probably never knew 
But then they started hitting all sorts of places in Dahia. So they just massacre people at will and Western media journalists, or some of them are in Beirut, but in safe areas, they'll say, yes, you know, Hezbollah sites, Hezbollah stronghold. And strongholds, that. yeah. It's we know this terminology yeah. very well. Yeah, and, and in Gaza, of course, this is the excuse for bombing schools and hospitals. And, absolutely. You know, this incredible story that Hezbollah is storing weapons inside, not weapons, missiles, yeah. inside yeah. people's kitchens. You know, in we've kitchen. heard this so many times we're laughing but the consequences of course of this this incredible strategy of, of propaganda and lies the is, is the media. death of innocent civilians yeah the western media is the propaganda wing of the israeli mm -hmm. I totally agree with you both. However, I also want to raise something. I mean, the, the, the media on the other side, let's say, it's also, it has the responsibility to fill this vacuum. Uh, it, for example, after 2003 and 2006 wars, they had all the time to establish media outlets uh, that are influential and can impact the public opinion. And I'm going to only speak about uh, Syria, for example. Nowadays, uh, in Syria, most people either watch my Dean, for example, and I'm I'm saying this with a heavy heart. It's uh, it's a very bad coverage uh, for what's going on because it's all sensational and they don't present solid, let's say, analysis for what's happening. So people go and watch what is called former senior uh, commanders or officers. Uh, appearing on Al Jazeera or Al Arabiya, and it, they, those are peddling Zionist talking points, right? So they're poisoning also the people's brains easily because there is no alternative media outlets trying to counter these arguments on the other side. I think this is a really big responsibility for the people of the region and the governments of the region to present a solid media outlet or multiples in order to face this intellectual, uh, 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 let's say, conflict and battles of ideas in the region. We always keep this era for the other side. For example, Al Jazeera, they have been calling the, uh, I'm going to just call it killed people in, in Palestine as martyrs, and the killed people in Lebanon as killed people. So you see the differences in the terminologies when Al Jazeera Arabic uses for the same same scenario, uh, same bombs, God, and the people are in, in Lebanon yes, die or they're killed. Exactly, uh, and it is it is something that uh, they have all these military experts <laughs> trying to portray things in a, a different matter because they have their own revenge against the Iranians, against Hezbollah, against Syria, and this is very unhealthy for the entire uh, region, and the people are paying the price. Imagine. Now, if, if, I'm just saying hypothetically, if Hezbollah is destroyed because uh, Al Jazeera is also continuing its, let's say, anti-Hezbollah uh, uh, reporting, what is going to happen to Palestine if Hezbollah is not there? So this is the real question that many people are not addressing. But here we have a situation now that Nasrallah is assassinated. And I was reading an article by Ali Hashem. Now, Ali, I respect him immensely. He is a, a senior uh, journalist for Al Jazeera, and uh, he published a brilliant article, but this is just a, a quick snap for what he said. The assassination of Syed Hassan Nasrallah is not just the assassination of a person in a high-ranking position. In short, it is an Israeli-American announcement, and they cannot be separated in such a decision of the launch of the operation to strangle the caught Iranian occupation by disintegrating its arms, not striking them, and then moving on to finish off its head after it has lost all its tools of power. The assassination of Nasrallah was a blow to Hezbollah, but it undoubtedly put the sword to the throat of Iran, which lost not only a strong ally and the leader it considered one of its limbs, but also the spearhead of its offensive force and the first line of defense for the axis of resistance. And I think in this case, uh, Said Mohammed Narendi, I'm hearing lots of criticism uh, uh, directed at Iran. People are even writing in the live chat and uh, posting under my uh, tweets. They say we hear much talk, but little actions from Iran. How do you explain Iran's inaction after Haniyeh's assassination, which shook the deterrence equation in favor of Israel? So in their uh, perspective, when Iran didn't retaliate after Haniyeh's assassination, <laughs> Israel thought that uh, the deterrence has been broken and now that they can strike 
again, and all of a sudden we've seen entire leadership of Hezbollah has been assassinated. So were it not for the inaction of Iran, these assassinations would not have happened. Well, first, I'd like to point out that I agree about the fact that we are not good at media at all. And to be very blunt, uh, the reason why... Bombing in Damascus. ...was that uh, after they carried out that first day of uh, genocidal airstrikes killing 500 people in the south and central Lebanon, I quickly came to Beirut because I thought I would be able to probably have a limited amount of impact as an individual because we don't have much media. Uh, I know I'm not an important person, but that's just, you know, this we all do what we can. But uh, I've been criticized a lot, and a lot of people are very hostile towards me, which I find very interesting in a way that uh, Iran is, uh, a couple of years ago, Iran was, a few years ago, Iran was always attacked, and now people from across the world are contacted me, contacting me from Africa, from Latin America, why don't you hit Israel, <laughs> which is, I find <laughs> extraordinary how popular Iran is and how Iran is now seen as, sort of the savior that, you know, they, it, should, it should be more proactive. And this is such a difference from uh, in the past when I always had to defend Iran being a, just a legitimate uh, state, uh, you know, just, you know, the, as a normal country. Now it's seen in such a different way than it was before. But I've said this many times over the past few weeks, Iran has its own calculations. I don't know what goes on behind closed doors, but I said from day one, and I have continued to say uh, until now, that Iran will hit the Israeli regime back and it will hit it hard. But there are many calculations. Uh, and of course, this is just my personal analysis. I'm not spe I don't know anything about what goes behind closed doors, obviously. Otherwise, I couldn't talk. But uh, first of all, Iran has to make sure that the world is on Iran's side. It's on the side of the resistance. It's uh, not going to be on Iran's side, Dr. Marandi. This well, is the problem, right? Well, uh, I, I think the world has changed a lot. And uh, Iran and the resistance need the Israeli regime to f escalate before they respond. Because the, the West has a powerful media, and we don't have a response to that. And they are very good at turning the tables. And everything has been about, look how everything, you know, uh, they, they justified everything for Israel, the Israeli regime in Gaza, and then gradually people turned against the West and the Western media. And now when they murder uh, uh, Sayyid Hassan, but slaughter hundreds of people in the process, they gloat. And it's as if you know they've, they've been able to forget all the crimes that they've committed, both while uh, the mar they martyred them of Sayyid Hassan took place and also uh, during the year before. They're very good at changing the narratives, turning things around. But, but by escalating, the Israeli regime has created uh, a situation where, where everyone, see, forget the West, the rest of the world sees the regime. The West is not the international community. It's not even, <laughs> it's increasingly uh, less important. I'm not trying to say it's nothing, but it's increasingly less important than it was before. The international community sees what Israel, the Israeli regime is. So when Iran ultimately responds, Iran wants to make sure that everyone, the Chinese, the Russians, the Brazilians, the, uh, the South Africa, neighboring countries, friendly countries, recognize that Iran is not the problem. It is the Israeli regime. Because this could lead to a regional war. This could lead to the Americans entering the war. And Iran wants to make sure that it is not blamed for this. It is the Americans and the Israelis are, that are blamed if there is a global econ economic catastrophe. Because I have no doubt that if the Americans start striking, then American bases and assets in Iraq will be gone. And of course in Syria as well. But in Iraq, they'll be gone. And then those countries and, and those hope bases that the United States has in the Persian Gulf, those regimes that host those bases and those assets, that could that would lead to a global economic catastrophe that uh, 1929 would, in my opinion, seem moderate. The, the crisis, the, the depression, would seem moderate to what I think will happen. So for Iran, it is very important 
that the focus is on the Israeli regime, that people blame the Israelis and see the Israeli regime for what it's doing. That's one issue. Another issue is that the Iranians, at least during one period of time, and I think Sayyid Hassan also alluded to this a few weeks ago, that during the negotiations, and this does not cover this whole period, but during the negotiations, you, we knew, I don't know if everyone knew, but I knew, and I'm pretty sure the two of you knew, that those negotiations for a ceasefire were all fake. Yes. They were going to lead nowhere. However, if Iran had struck during those weeks, you have no doubt that the Americans and the Israelis would have said, we were all, and the Europeans and the media, they would have said that we were on the verge of a breakthrough and we were about to sign a deal when the Iranians, who are nasty, evil people and who want Palestinians to be killed for their own selfish interests, they fired these missiles or, and attacked, or the Hezbollah attacked, because they don't want the people of Gaza to live in peace. They have exposed themselves and that sort of thing. So I think Mohammed Mavandi Iran is 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 working on um, like dealing with its foes and enemies like they are rational actors and this is something yeah. that I would like to hear uh, Vanessa but, like what do you think about the yeah, because if we final say final. we say yes please yeah. I, I don't I, I don't think that is the case I think that the Iranians first of all they were milking it as much as they could because the Israelis for weeks were uh, flights were canceled they were forced to move around their strategic assets constantly. Uh, people lived in fear. But the Iranians have all, I, I said this from the beginning, that the Iranians will hit the Israelis very hard, but they are looking for the best moment to do so. And apparently, from what we're hearing now, mm -hmm. we seem to be very close. From the news that is coming out, we seem to be very close. Vanessa, what's your take on Iran's posture? And uh, don't you see that, do you agree with the motion that uh, the delay in the reaction from Iran has emboldened Israel in the region? Yeah, unfortunately, I, I do think it has. And I think, you know, if I look at the sequence of events, um, we had uh, the tragedy of the death of President Raisi and Foreign Minister Abdul Hayan. We then had uh, the inaugural, the, well, the election, which was a surprise even for people watching um, the election in Iran. To be honest, uh, well, I the, was pretty sure that, Shkian, uh, I, I was yeah. actually, as soon as I saw the the candidates, I was pretty sure Pazishkian would win. Okay, for, for uh, and people. and then you know uh -huh. then we, but then we had the almost immediately even. You know, at the inauguration ceremony, you had the assassination of Hanye. And I guess for a lot of people and here, the feeling is that under Raisi and Abdul Hayyan, there would have been a retaliation. And the problem was, for whatever reason, and looking at it from the outside, it appears that Pajashkian of course, and Zarif, I, I would actually put his influence even higher, uh, decided to try and de-escalate and again, put themselves in this camp of being able to talk to what they perceive to be a rational actor. And this is where I kind of have a problem because Russia made this mistake for eight years with Ukraine, believing in the Minsk agreements, right? Until finally the war happened anyway because it, it, it had to happen, because NATO was, was building up its military presence and its threat to, to Russia right on its borders. It had to happen. But eight years were lost, and how many civilians were lost in the Donbass while Russia was kind of playing uh, to the Western rules to a large degree? And at what point does Iran uh, disengage from, in a sense, still being um, entrapped in this in this Western paradigm. Because everyone at that point, when Hanye was assassinated in Iran, in the IRGC uh, quarters, everyone actually, their sympathy was with Iran at that point. And then it, it kind of, for whatever reasons it's, it, it was delayed, 
and then people started to and then of course the tragedy continued in gaza it increased in lebanon the assassination of um, the commanders the high level command of hezbollah which i know the structure means that that command is instantly replaced but as an optic how it appeared to people is that iran's uh delaying for the reasons that you've explained allowed israel to escalate to the extent that it did and put all of the people in the south of lebanon at huge risk and i guess what i'm kind of interested in is there um a schism between the supreme or you know the the leadership and the government is that what is creating this delay um or is it only for the reasons that you spoke about this and, was my and, next question thank you very oh, much sorry. Minister, for raising. no this was a great question this is my uh, you're conspiring against me on that uh before the program i i knew something <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I would actually, and I'm sorry for my long responses, but um, when you're at, when you teach at university, you have to fill, <laughs> so you get used to just talking and talking. Um, I, I was actually going to add to what I said and give a couple of other reasons. I, I don't deny, but I can't confirm either really, that mm. this, this sense existed in, in parts of the new administration. But again, I'm not, I can't say for sure, because I don't think actually Dr. Zeddy plays a very significant role in the government. But, and I don't, I can't say for sure that Dr. Zeddy has any such, such a view. I know there are lots of people in Iran because I see on Twitter that they, they have this hostility. Mm -hmm. I am, I am, at, you know, I'm in, just for the sake of your viewers, I am attacked in Iran both by reformists and by many of these uh, hardliners as they call them in the West. My, my personal view is that this, uh, I, I really can't be safe for certain. But what I can say is that I can add two things to what I've said already. One is that when the new administration came to power, uh, it, you know, this is a bureaucracy. Ministers are changed, deputy presidents are changed, the first vice president is changed. The new administration, may have, and I don't know again, may have wanted some time so that they could settle down. Because, mm -hmm. because a change in government is a big thing. And it's going to be, it's going to have impact on Iran for many months to come before they really get, learn what they're supposed to be doing, these government ministers. So it's going to, it's a, it's a but the first few weeks is, is very tough because they, you know, they have to learn how to govern. And they have to learn about the, the bodies that they are in. And then we're move, we may move towards a, a very, I don't want to say crisis, but if we hit the Israeli regime, they want to hit back and then we'll hit them again. So it will have consequences. The other thing, the second point that I wanted to mention is that Iran also had to prepare itself militarily. Mm -hmm. Because if Iran strikes, then the Israelis may strike, the Americans may strike. We don't know what will happen. But the, so the Iranians have to adjust. They have to take out whatever equipment or purchase new equipment or build new equipment. Or they have to move things around, put certain things underground. They have to prepare from all, you know, prepare themselves for, for, for the consequences. And perhaps, again, this, this is all speculation on my part, all speculation. We had the hottest winter ever in Iran this year. Sorry, the hottest summer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, it was the winter and spring was pretty good in Iran. Late winter and spring, we had a lot of rainfall and snow, which compensated for a couple of years of, of drought. But we've had a very hot summer, very hot. If we had, let's say, electricity problems, during the height of summer, especially in some parts of Iran, that could have, you know, th these are all things that have to be a part of calculations. So uh, I think that if there's going to be a, a conflict, 
Iran has to be ready. Its bureaucracy, its infrastructure, its military. It also can't give, let the, it doesn't want its friends and allies across the world to feel that Iran is being provocative. And, uh, and also with regards to the negotiations. But I don't see the administration, uh, President Pezishkian, is at all standing against the president. One final point, and I've said a lot, and that is that, and this is something that the two of you may not appreciate, and that is that Dr. Pezishkian is not a great speaker. He, he, he talks like ordinary people, and he's he, 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 you know, he's, like, he's a man of the people, you know, wears a jacket and he's, he's smart, he, he's, he's highly educated, but he's not a very good speaker. And when he went to New York, I think a couple of things that he said were <laughs> misinterpreted in a big way. Although I think a couple of things that other people said in New York were not appropriate uh, and uh, should not have been said in that context. But in general, Dr. Pezishion, in a, in, he, uh, I don't want to say anything uh, that's not respectful, but I think that he, he's, not a, he's not a politician. And it's going to take time. I actually told people that I don't think he should go to New York this year because he's not prepared for this. And I think I was vindicated, but of course, no one was in <laughs> the problem with the CNN interview was also uh, that the question was unrelated to the answer. The question was about uh, Iran's support for Hezbollah, and the answer was how Hezbollah cannot fight alone against Israel because Israel receives all this support from the United States. <laughs> like, in my opinion, he gave an answer that was unrelated to the question, and this has created lots of confusion, and people are asking uh, lots of legitimate questions. So here is going to be the last uh, question for both of you. We have 10 minutes. And I will start with Vanessa. The war, the regional war is imminent and the par the axis of resistance is trying to delay it. We, however, it is imminent and they're trying to delay the un, uh, inevitable if, uh, uh, for the region. you agree yeah. or disagree? No, I mean, I agree completely. And I, I think, again, you know, even from Hezbollah and from Syria, but I mean, Syria is in a kind of unique situation. It's still fighting the regime change war on multiple fronts. It's occupied virtually on all the borders. Its resources are occupied, uh, you know, but it's still providing, just for people to understand, it's still uh, providing tremendous support to the entire resistance axis. Its territory, of course, is used by different resistance factions to launch attacks um, against uh, the Zionist entity. And, uh, of course, Syria receives the response from the Zionist entity also for, for if you like, being the, the safe territory for those resistance factions to operate in. Um, but I think what, what we have seen, and Hezbollah was very clear, they were maintaining a de-escalation strategy. In other words, it was very much if, if Israel targeted um, a hospital, then Hezbollah would, you know, but, and, and also Hezbollah, the entire resistance axis, has always tried to um, avoid civilian casualties in their attacks. In other words, in my opinion, the resistance axis is, is acting from a moral basis, Absolutely. from a basis of uh, principle and humanitarian law and international law. But as you mentioned, Kivok, they're not facing an enemy that has any limitations on its inhumanity. And that is the problem. And that is what people are waking up to. It doesn't matter to what extent they try to restrict or restrain the escalation and the expansion. It's coming anyway. And, and Israel is creating the Yeah, Israel is creating the environment in which to expand that war, either through propaganda, through um, all, all the means that it has at its disposal and with the support of the UK, the US and the EU, which is, you know, that's a tremendous propaganda complex. And so I think now the realization here, just from speaking to people on the ground here in, in 
the resistance in the military is no we're, we're heading now into the expansion there's no stopping it because Netanyahu, it's been seen that the United States, although it keeps talking about ceasefire, every time it mentions a ceasefire or sends a representative to the region, actually it escalates. So, you know, people are starting to see the pattern. As soon as Hochstein comes to, to Lebanon, it escalates, it expands a little bit further. And I just wanted to add something to the strategy of Israel. Um, you mentioned the 40,000 uh, soldiers allegedly on the border in, in the Golan territory, which of course is a lie. Uh, but this is being created, in my opinion, to, to provide the pretext for Israeli aggression in the south of Syria. And of course, what did we see today? They bombed at least three of the air defense uh, radar uh, yes. systems in the south. They've removed all the mines between the occupied Golan territories and uh, the Syrian Golan territory. Um, so one assumes they've done that in order to enable them to, to cross the terrain without getting yes. blown up by their own mines. Yes. Um, and I think what they're really trying to do is to close all the borders in Lebanon, so to enclose Lebanon, to enclose Syria, to, to cut Syria off completely from Lebanon and from Iraq, all the other borders are under occupation, pretty much. Um, and actually, Marwa mentioned last night the Battle of Baku, where they tried to do something uh, very similar, and they failed. But I think this is part of their plan, and it's also why the US has been bombing al Bukumal and why they've been trying to take control of al Bukumal for, for years now, to finally close um that eastern syrian border that allows humanitarian aid and relief to come in from iran through iraq and into syria so i think borders uh, are a very important part of uh, the zionist strategy dr marandi in short is a regional Sorry. war inevitable and um is the access of resistance uh, trying to postpone it but it is going to happen anyway i'm pretty sure that that's the direction that we're heading in and uh, the Israeli regime is pushing for an escalation and the international community I think everyone is witnessing who's who is pushing for this escalation the example of Syria of course is a, a very good example uh, to prove this point I only want to add one thing uh, because uh, Vanessa said, said it quite well all those, ours, all those friends of ours who are wondering what was going on in Syria a decade ago, this is what it was about. It was all about now. It was all about cutting off Hezbollah yeah. and the West Bank from the resistance. NATO regimes in Israel did a deal with, or let me put it the other way around, regional regimes Erdogan, unfortunately, did a deal with the devil. Mm. It created this dirty war. Erdogan would have get, received a, part, a piece of the cake, and then there would have been a broken Syria, which would have made Hezbollah isolated and the West Bank without protection anymore, thanks to the traitor Abd Abdullah in Amman. But... Uh, the Americans failed, but they still have a, but they weakened Syria. Syria is today uh, key to supporting the resistance, but it has an, an Al Qaeda occupation in the north. The Americans and NATO tolerate it, and uh, Turkey continues to support it, so do other regimes. And they have an American occupation in the north and northeast where, Al where ISIS is active and cooperating with the Americans. Why? Because this goes back to the Defense Intelligence Agency document of 2012. It's, it's, it's linked to that, where they said that U.S. allies in the region want to create a Salafist entity between Iraq and Syria, yes. break Syria off from mm -hmm. Iraq, you know, to isolate Syria. And that means the end of the, this victory bridge, let's call it. Yeah. General Flynn, Michael Flynn, he, who was the, he was the head of the Intel Defense Intelligence Agency and on Al Jazeera and on Mehdi Hassan's show of all people and of all programs and of all people, <laughs> 
admitted <laughs> that the United States was this was supported by the United States. So those who thought the war in Syria was about sectarianism or that's all nonsense. It was a dirty war by the West to secure Israel, Israel's position for good and everyone made sacrifices in order to prevent this from happening. But now it's becoming clear as day what this was all about. And Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah, his role in saving Syria will never be forgotten. His role in saving Iraq will never be forgotten. His role in saving Lebanon will never be forgotten. His role in helping Ansarullah defeat the genocidal war in Yemen will never be forgotten. And now all of these countries are a part of this axis of resistance that is killing the Israeli regime uh, it's become death by a thousand cuts and hope I'm, I'm I'm not saying that the regime will fall tomorrow and mm. there are many dangers ahead and we will see very dark days and months ahead but I think this we are this we are in a period where we're going to see the beginning of the end but it will be tough and uh, yes. the war could be catastrophic not just for the region but for the world mm. Lady and gentlemen, I would like to thank you both of you for this great insights and analysis. This was the biggest live panel that I have ever done. Over 3,000 people watching this on three different platforms. I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for this civilized conversation. I think uh, most people lack this type of conversation to learn about what's happening in the region, especially when they most people have the access to mainstream media. You have two minutes to express your opinion and then they cut you all the time and interrupt you. I think this type of conversation is very healthy and it uh, also spreads awareness among the people. So thank you so much. And also, guys, if you like to follow Sayyid Muhammad Merendis and Vanessa's X accounts, both are in the description below. And if you like this content, you can simply hit the like button, share this video with your friends. And if you want to support this work, you can become a patron. Thank you so much, uh, Sayyid Muhammad Merendi and Vanessa again. Thank you. Thank you. Peace be upon you, both of you, and peace be upon you guys for watching, and we will see you tomorrow, 5 p.m. Central European Time, 11 a.m. Eastern American Time. Salam.